Okay, good. Good evening. Uh, thank you. I realize it's a long day, so I'll definitely not take the whole hour that was allocated to me. Uh, before I start, I'd like to dedicate uh, this talk to Gerard Unger. Gerard Unger was here at the first uh, ICTVC and also last time in Thessaloniki. Uh, he's a friend, was a friend of the conference and of many people here, a very strong supporter. Uh, he died last November. Now, uh, about the talk, I was trying to come up with a title, and as many things, uh, yeah, well, you came up with your talk first, so I thought, nah, okay. So I thought, what follows the end of structure? Uh, okay, what's happening there? So it got me thinking quite a lot about it, and I thought a lot about, uh, well, if you don't have structure, you don't have things that may be coming from the top down, you don't have things that are organized and so on, then what do you have in the absence of a top-down structure and then also you, you don't want to have something that is chaos. So it's got me thinking a lot about the other. And I've been thinking a lot about this increasingly, not least because I live in a deeply confused country right now with Brexit, uh, also because I travel a lot and every time I pass a checkpoint, I am reminded that not all European passports are the same. Greek passports are not the same as other European passports. Uh, they are seen as much more suspicious uh, by border control agents. And whenever I travel to the States, I tend to have a fairly high probability of being picked out for random security checks. Uh, maybe they're random, maybe because if you look like me and you travel on your own, the probabilities are higher. But the idea of, well, who are you? Where do you belong? How do you define yourself? Uh, has been very much my mind. So this is where I live. This is uh, sort of England and Wales. And you can see a little bit in London, which is actually quite diverse. Uh, I'm in the bit that says Southeast almost, which is less diverse. But there's quite a few people who are in the other bit. Uh, and what I face very often is this, in a lot of interactions with authority. This is a very standard form uh, from the British government and it's standardized. Uh, and I find myself uh, thinking, should I click the any white thing? I'm definitely not part of any of the column A bit. Uh, and I go all the way down to these things and I realize that for a lot of environments, uh, some people think of me as white there's certain places in Northern Europe where they don't think of me as entirely white. Uh, being from the Mediterranean region has certain connotations. Uh, so I tend to always to tick the other or any white background and I write Mediterranean there and just hoping that the system will break. The interesting thing is that uh, when they um, process all these results, everything that's in column B is bundled as other. Uh, the same thing happens in other countries. This is from the Greek statistics uh, organization. Uh, the bits that are not Greek nationality are 972,000 people. It's nearly a million people who are other. Uh, and of course, that assumes that these other people are uniformly other. But then if you open the newspapers, which I think still in Greece, you have to announce if you're getting married, uh, you will see quite a lot of marriages by people who have different nationalities and backgrounds. So then you're thinking, how do they define themselves? Or how do their children define themselves? There's other of other or something. So there's this very big box into which people are fitting in. So this all stuff is in the background in my mind. Uh, and I'll try to put this in a typographic environment. So things that I'm very consciously aware of, partly again because of my work and where I travel, is that there is a rapid change in people's access to texts. Literacy levels have been rising a lot uh, throughout the world, especially in what was the developing world. More importantly, there's a huge uh, generational change. So you get people above a certain age having not that much ac access to text, but people below a certain age have a much higher access to text in a much more uniform manner throughout the world, which is very interesting. Combine this with the growth in urbanization, so how many people are living in cities, in the last four or five years, I think we've passed the point of 50% of everybody living in cities, which has huge structural differences. Uh, and also we have a lot of increase in migration, uh, and that's net migration. So that's uh, 
what's left after you take into account all the two-way uh, movements across towns. What is also more interesting is the trade between places. Uh, now, if, this is an interesting chart because if you look at it, you think that there's less of things happening. Uh, everything adds up to 100%, but what happens in the left of the chart is that just the rich countries trade with each other. And then as you go to the right, then there's much more trade between developing countries themselves and developing and rich countries and so on. So there is a much more, for want of a better word, diverse profile in how people trade and exchange goods. So all of this stuff is there. And if you travel in certain parts of the world, you can't avoid being aware of this thing, how younger generations especially are much more mobile, much more aware of other communities, of how their identities might be uh, multiplicitous. So you're looking at people who might define themselves uh, with a regional identity, but also educationally through their profile or maybe some part of the work through, because they work with an international community and therefore they see themselves as belonging to a group that exceeds their immediate regional profile. And this always connects to texts. Uh, that is something that sounds like an obvious statement, uh, but it's actually quite critical. Uh, this is a statement from the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Committee of about 12 years ago, which was instigated to look at the rights of Aboriginal uh, communities. And they stressed particularly the role of language rights, and they were, the relevant section connects also to writing and reading and so on, and publishing rights uh, as central to the identity of these communities. The whole point was that if you don't enable the communities to be able to read, write, publish texts, then the communities actually lose key aspects of their identity. So, okay, texts are design, design is central to our identity. Uh, what is also quite interesting that we're operating in a world where there's quite a lot of discourse, at least in the Northwest, so a lot of stuff is going on where people are talking about being much more reflective about design, uh, understanding influences and bias in design. This is last couple of weeks from the AJ journal on what does it mean to decolonize design. But this is a very well-intentioned, but again, a Northwestern look on the discourse on decolonization which places its own restrictions on how people talk about. Because again, people who write these kinds of texts operate within a certain academic or professional environment, and you might see that they use terms that are acceptable in that environment, but might be quite different in another environment. Uh, those of you who have experience of diversity forms, like I showed earlier from the United States, I don't know if Canada is the same, the categories are completely different. So what is other is very different in America than it is in Europe, and again, it changes in different countries. So we can't even agree on what perhaps categories of otherness might be. Uh, I wear a number of hats, and one of them is, is the president of uh, uh, ATIPI, which is a global organization. And this is relevant because uh, we, by default, work every year with a different community, uh, increasingly, uh, in areas where we haven't had presence. And there it's quite interesting to have discussions about what it means to define yourself as a professional, someone who has ownership of an identity and so on. And just a few months back, I had the, uh, the pleasure of being in Colombo. Now, Sri Lanka is a three-script country growing into a four-script country. This is actually quite an interesting environment. So you're in the streets and you have English, uh, Sinhala, Tamil, and increasingly Chinese because of the, in, uh, the investment and the trade there. Uh, but these are people who by default grow up with uh, the idea of a fairly complex identity, one there where they might have members of family or members of the circle that are extremely uh, say rich in their backgrounds, quite different from what generations like mine in Greece grew up with. Uh, which is actually quite a humbling environment because you realize that a lot of the assumptions that you make about other people's backgrounds and so on don't apply. But then also this translates into how they communicate because the idea of how do you produce any kind of text has to respond to this idea of multiplicity. So then by default everything is at least biscriptal or if not triscriptal. 
uh, and has to accommodate different educational levels that are associated with each of the communities. So again, this is actually quite rich. Uh, then we see uh, quite a lot of activity in environments where they are non-English and quite happily so. And I say this because uh, I'm going to be talking about the issue of language a bit. Uh, we organized events in Mexico where there's quite a lot of discourse and scholarship on design and it's perfectly healthy uh, because there's a lot of people speaking Spanish and publishing in Spanish and they don't need the large enough community that they don't need the, the feel the need to communicate with the English speaking world in this world. So there's a sort of separation between the two, but actually that doesn't mean that the discourse doesn't happen. So we tried to solve uh, this kind of problems, and one of them was essentially to pass the definition problem onto the communities themselves. So when we announced the scheme for uh, enabling people to attend the conference from communities that define themselves as not participating very much in the typographic community. We asked them to define themselves, how they saw themselves as not participating. So we didn't have a set of rules or criteria that said you need to fill these criteria in and therefore you're eligible for uh, to get this money or something. We said you need to explain to us why you think you should uh, receive the support. Of course, there's a filter there. It is an English language speaking organization and it assumes that you have a passport that will allow you at some point to get a visa. Again, depending on the country you're from, uh, this is, might be a challenge. The same thing uh, with uh, our code of conduct, which probably took the longest to develop uh, from many of these kinds of texts. This is the kind of thing that's like the terms and conditions that maybe when you're buying your ticket to a conference, you just click through, Shani, I can see you moving your head. You, you read it next time, there'll be a test. Yeah. Uh, but essentially it says, what do we think belong, being a member of this community is? And we surveyed a lot of similar documents which started with the prohibitive. So you're not supposed to be rude. You're not supposed to call people out. You're not supposed to have at hominem attacks or whatever. And we thought that doesn't work. First of all, we want to have a positive statement for how people behave in the community. But secondly, we were very conscious of the fact that English is a second language for maybe 90% of our audience. Uh, and a lot of them might not have any familiarity with how we use the term. So a lot of effort was being made to have a couple of different versions of this, which would allow people to understand the basic principles in a region agnostic way, and so on. Throughout these uh, little examples is, is the problem of bias. Uh, and at the heart is the assumption that whoever is trying to do anything has to be conscious of their bias. And I am very biased in everything I do right now. Uh, and if you're involved in typographic design research, you are very conscious of this. So uh, I'm going to drop a little bit deeper. Um, it's a picture called the bookworm. And this is almost a very easy target, but this is clearly some uh, very wealthy uh, European male with a very well-stocked library. And the painting is called the bookworm. Uh, Ricardo Loco, one of uh, our PhD students, uh, sourced it because one of his problems is this uh, this idea of authority. Authority that declares something and then that becomes an accepted wisdom. Uh, you might be more familiar with people like uh, Stanley Morrison. Now, if you read a lot of his texts about the history of typography today, first of all, they don't really stand up to criticism. They are just opinion pieces that are not really supported by research, but they have the weight of historical acceptance and people referencing, citing his texts again and again. Uh, more close to Greek, uh, Proctor, Robert Proctor on the left and Victor Scholder on the right, two seminal uh, researchers on the history of Greek typography. Now, there's an interesting thing. Robert Proctor died at 35, really young. Uh, he was one of the first researchers of the Greek incunables in the British Museum. Uh, at the time, he started identifying methods for looking at incunables, identifying types, and so on. He himself made notes about the shortcomings of his observations because he was quite reflective and young and he was realizing maybe I haven't got it right. And then he goes on a trip to the Alps and dies. 
Uh, so everybody says, this amazing young scholar died, his texts are sacred. So what happened was even though he himself had expressed doubt about his findings, his findings sort of got locked and they became something that was cited uh, but not questioned. And that was something that was continued by Scholderer, who himself was quite opinionated in his views, but also conducted only the research that was possible to do within the basements of the British Museum. Now, the British Museum, British Library now, is quite well stocked when it comes to books, but it's not universally, uh, it doesn't have everything that you need to do. Uh, for that generation, the idea of maybe traveling to the German collections, the Swiss collections, the, the Italian collections, to see other originals or other copies of the same thing that you were looking was something quite alien to their methodology. So then you might find quite a lot of uh, texts that discussed, for example, the Greeks of Aldus, and they would rely only on one copy of uh, a set, not necessarily a review of all the texts. So you have a quite a partial perspective but actually expressed with the authority of the institution, of the British Museum, and also with the authority of someone who is essentially trained in those, those kind of categories of people to have trust in their opinion, because all these people would belong to certain demographics. That is slowly being unpacked now by current researchers, uh, because we're realizing that these people, despite their, well, uh, good intentions, they imposed quite a lot of 19th and 20th century assumptions about what a typeface is onto the research that they were doing. So they assumed, for example, that typefaces are things that maintain their integrity in the same way that you would go and get a monotype or a linotype case and it has all the letters and they move all together. Or you might go to Figgins and buy a foundry set and you would buy a pack that has all the letters. So their idea of trade was of complete letters. Whereas a lot of the recent research is coming at actually this is not how things happened. People would actually switch individual letters and if you were printing a text and you wore out all your A's, you would go to your, your next door printer and say, can I borrow some A's or do you have a matrix for A's and I can cast some A's and I can put them into my bit. Because that's what you do if you just need some A's and you don't need a whole new typeface. So a lot of the older findings that were reproduced for decades, simply because the bias was not recognized, uh, have been reproduced into quite accepted scholarship. That extends throughout the 20th century. We see uh, the idea of authority, design authority, and uh, the appeal to systems. This is Herbert Byers. Uh, letters connected to the Bauhaus. We see Karl Gerstner's design programs, the, a system for designing pretty much everything. This idea that there is a set of rules that are given from the top down by an authority, in this case the author, that also defines an educational program and then the students from that program will produce things that fit that environment. Typographic products of this are everywhere around us. Uh, what is connected to this is the ability to write about that stuff. So then if you have not only a community that produces this kind of, let's say, view or opinion, but then also you have the scholarship that goes with it. And now what we see very much with the post-war Swiss movement is this idolization uh, of a certain way of designing and so on. Then you have something that becomes almost, again, sacred in its reception and it's almost not right to question it. It then gets assumed as something that is worth imitating by other communities which might share nothing in relation to the original cultural environment. There is, uh, however, a, a counterpoint to this. It comes a lot uh, by people who often have trained in terms of research skills uh, in the Northwestern institutions, but actually often return back to their home regions to dig into the archives. Uh, Alessandro Colizzi was a professor in Montreal until last year. Uh, from the autumn, he'll be back in Italy digging into the archives of Nebbiolo, uh, which were we finding that the Italians were doing amazing stuff that nobody had written about, or actually some Italians had written about, but actually nobody really reads Italian if they're not Italian. And certainly none of the Italian scholars would also publish in English. I'm trying to be very polite here. But it meant that that scholarship was all an island. And if you were Italian, you would share that scholarship and nobody else outside it would know about it. So you would assume that the Italians did nothing 
in that respect. Uh, and also, maybe the archives were company archives, so they were not in an environment where it, they were used to working with students or researchers to open the archives and bring them in. And in most cases, you find that more things that people expect were happening, but people haven't started digging in the right archives or in the right way. Uh, this is a couple of snapshots from a, um, a PhD which is weeks away. She's going to kill me if I say this. Weeks away from completion. Uh, Elena Papasisa working on Armenian typefaces. Again, this idea of looking at original material uh, afresh with very much control methodologies for image capture and comparison in a way that allows you to ask questions about the motivations of the people who are making these. Uh, these types. In her case, she's looking a lot of how, about how a um, community of the diaspora of Armenia in the middle of the 19th century in Paris introduced new ideas about style into Armenian typefaces and leading to a process that we would recognize as Latinization. Uh, if you're thinking, what does this have to do with us, then think of Corais and all the other Greek scholars who were connected to the French Enlightenment uh, and so on. Uh, so quite a lot of this is happening by people who are diving into other communities. It's also, however, much more interestingly happening locally. Uh, this is uh, Sumanthi Samarawi Krama. She's the head of the Department of, for Design in the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka. She's the first person who did a PhD uh, in, uh, on Sinhala. And she's amazing because there's nothing, that, nobody who could really supervise her properly. She's done everything herself. Um, and she's essentially arrived at very similar methodologies that, like what we see in work like Elena's, in doing morphological analysis, doing uh, uh, some work that looks at different instances of printed material exactly to uncover ideas about the morphology and the development of letter forms. Uh, that small unit now is developing as a center for study and research uh, very strongly. There's a very lively community uh, regionally. Uh, and sometimes, uh, depending on the environment, you might get a very top-down environment. This is a founding of uh, an association to look at traditional forms of Chinese characters and how they have mutated or developed. Uh, in the transition to typographic forms. My point is that there's quite a lot of things that you can read into typefaces, and the reason for this is that not because the way they look are particularly interesting, but because they are actually pretty central in how we interact and do pretty much anything. So this picks up on a discussion that we've been having for some time. Uh, a few years back, uh, I was talking about typeface design being a knowledge profession where making the forms is not interesting, but understanding the knowledge environment around them uh, and what things mean culturally is important. So we've been developing this with this young man, uh, Pathum Godavata. Uh, he's also from Sri Lanka. This idea of fonts as infrastructure, that things are central to how a society operates, and then what do we do with this? Now, this is an obvious thing, because if you want to find out how do I go back to Athens, uh, you might say, okay, the stuff that tells me how do I go back uh, needs fonts. Even though, if you look at the, the capitals at the top, they're all wrong, because they all have accents that they shouldn't have. So on some level, it's readable. On another, on another system, is broken, because actually it abuses the recognized form of the language. And there's all sorts of issues about this. I can still access the information about how to go home. Uh, if you look at something else that might be uh, trials for um, AR use of typefaces, this is by another student uh, called Nitish Yadav, who's now one of the most quickly recognized uh, researchers on uh, type in AR. Uh, his focus is on making sure that, in his case, Indian scripts are available. Because if you say only the Latin script will be available in the AR, AR environment, then essentially you're excluding quite a lot of people from access to any information that you want to show. In his case, uh, he's trialing a medical application and so on. So, how do you work with this idea of fonts or infrastructure? They're essential. You're thinking, how do I support stuff? 
Uh, and I can't figure out exactly what it is that you support because script and language are not the same thing. Uh, sometimes they appear to overlap. I showed Armenian earlier and this Armenian script is only used for the Armenian language. Uh, in most cases it's not. If the Greek people in the audience are thinking, oh, Greek certainly only works for Greek. Well, what is the Greek language? Uh, because with three and a half thousand years of history, there's enough change in the shapes of the forms and the combinations, even the forms we're using, that actually is not very clear to define even the character set uh, for Greek. And then how do you deal with problems of historical dimensions? This will not make much sense if you can't read Greek, but uh, these are alternate spellings for words, uh, all of which are a point of contention by the two main authorities for how you should spell Greek words, which might suggests very well that the language is actually quite fluid and it reflects the historical tradition, but then it means that I need to be able not only to render them both, but if I have a hyphenation dictionary or a spelling dictionary on my system, what will it do? Do I have a dial that says uh, hyphenate according to the current orthography in the 80s or in the 60s, or if I'm typesetting a text by Roides, you know, show me 130 year old hyphenation dictionaries. Well, we should be able to do this, it doesn't do it. Uh, how do you hyphenate words that have different word origins? Maybe they have a sort of a romance origin and then they need to be hyphenated differently if I'm hyphenating an older text than if I'm hyphenating a newer text. Again, that stuff is not very difficult to imagine as problems. It's often quite difficult to solve because the source material is not very easy to parse. It takes quite a bit of time. Uh, so we tried to solve this and we started uh, last year with actually with a team of Google engineers uh, at Reading who were with us for about two weeks. We we're trying to figure out what does I support the language mean? Which of course for them is actually quite critical. It's entirely digital. It's essentially stuff on devices and browsers. So we thought, okay, let's have some levels because they were talking about we support this, we support that, and we're running into all these problems. So one is nothing, okay? Uh, this is an example of no digital support. Uh, it's a real manuscript from a uh, classicist, no, a linguist, sorry, uh, who was types, uh, typing in a typewriter his English text and then was writing with a pencil, the Greek because at the, it's about 15 years ago, because at the time he did not have access to a, a thing that could produce both the Greek letters and the uh, English letters. And then that had to be taken over by the typesetter, who unfortunately was me, and key by hand in everything. That was a pain in the neck. But it means that he can actually make any kind of mark that he wants. Uh, this happens much more frequently than we think. Uh, if I show you this, uh, unless you're from China, you might think this is a Chinese text. Uh, well, it's not, it's music. Uh, this is a very current project uh, that we're working on. Uh, there's a traditional Chinese instrument uh, called guqin, it's like saduri. Yeah? Uh, and the notation for it essentially is instructions for the hands, uh, move your left hand to the right or move the third string and so on. And they are written in characters that look like Chinese characters, but actually they're not readable as words. They're just instructions for the hands. Uh, and these things have never been translated into digital characters. Everything that has to do with this kind of music is written out by hand and then photographed and produced lithographically. And we're now putting together a Unicode proposal so this kind of music could be reproduced digitally. And you're thinking this is pretty late in the day, but actually there's quite a lot of stuff like this where pockets of users or communities uh, did not have access to the right kind of um, say, uh, channel during these, the early years of standardization and a lot of things just didn't get through. So this is happening right now. Uh, then sort of, level one, so we're turning the notch one up. Simple representation with just one form of character. This happens a lot and uh, it is the equivalent of a typewriter. You might think I could just hit something and I get something and that thing doesn't have any intelligence. It's just the visible mark of what it was. Uh, the oldest amongst you might remember things like this. This is a font from 1992 
what is interesting is not the shape of the letters, but uh, if you look at the names of the, of, of the characters above the Greek letters, they don't look like the character there. The font is masquerading as something else. So it is really is a typewriter in a digital environment where you think your, your computer thinks that you're typing, ooh, I don't know, an e grave and you're getting an epsilon varia, which is a completely different thing. Uh, and as long as people have a similarly hacked environment, sort of things are okay. Uh, that's not very helpful if you want to move things forward. So next level, uh, some sort of standardization uh, in the encoding of things. Uh, that's, pr I say, primarily Unicode, because especially in Asia, there's quite a lot of communities that use non-Unicode encodings, simply because they're uh, built into the machines that they're using. So in this case, you might have something like this where it looks similar, but actually the characters have the name of what they are. So you enable some interchange. You're still not enabling typography or anything, you're just making sure that maybe you can transmit a text. So this is the telex equivalent uh, of typography. And then third level, you might have some basic level uh, of support for authoring. So this is the equivalent of a plain text file. So this is what you might write just your older email in. Uh, something that doesn't have any awareness of formatting other than space uh, or maybe indents. Uh, so you might get no differentiation about the text within the text. So you might have a hyperlink that just looks like the normal text or you might get headings and so on. You can only differentiate them with space and so on. So there's a fake bit at the top. Of course, this is a problem because it assumes that there's just one version of each letter than you want. So for a lot of people, this is um, actually not satisfactory. I'm going to go to the extreme example. This is a, a manuscript, in this case, by Vergikos, doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, academics who study the transmission of texts, they try to identify errors in manuscripts. So if you can find that somebody was copying they were copying a Homer, and they can find that error in the same spelling error in a number of manuscripts, and they realize that those probably belong to the same transmission line, that that person who was writing the later text probably had the other text with the error in front of them and so on. And this is a really serious part of how they study transmission of knowledge, uh, transmission of text, and so on. And they rely on being able to identify the errors in, types, in typesetting. They're, they're errors in writing. So if you have a system that only gives you, uh, say, a canonical representation of the letter, then those academics actually cannot do it. So if you look at texts that medieval, uh, medievalists work on, they tend to use either multiple fonts at the same time or hacked fonts which allow them to type things that shouldn't happen. So the perispomeni over an epsilon, right? Uh, which your system should correct. And they're saying, actually, I need that because that person who wrote that perispomeni over the epsilon is the same person who copied that text and therefore I can find it. So it's an interesting uh, limitation and usually they, uh, there's all these marginal cases that are actually quite valuable. Then you're looking at things that have uh, the capacity to enable the proper activity. What do you, what's the minimum typographic environment you need to enable uh, education, business administration. If you think about it, okay, you need something like this. So you need uh, at least two tones of voice, typographic voice. The gov.uk is an interesting point because when it was released, they realized there's, they, there's no need for italic in there. So the government can say anything that it needs to tell you without emphasis. And that's intentional because that is a nuance in the text that is unreliable in its transmission. It's the same reason why if you look at contracts drafted by lawyers and notaries, uh, there's very particular use of punctuation and there's no typographic differentiation exactly because they don't want to rely on this for meaning. Uh, you can see the same thing in this. People are already, but again, the same thing. that You cannot actually do this kind of administration without having at least two levels of hierarchy. So you can actually give navigation, you can give structure to people. It's not very elegant, it's not very, but at least it begins to enable you to have in a school taxi the teacher's voice 
and the exercise or then the student's voice and so on. Because you need in a school text something that says solve this problem and then there's the problem and so on. Uh, then you might have things that enable this to work much more smoothly in a full range uh, of environments. Uh, so how do you make things work reliably across many different, mostly optical sizes? And this is where things uh, are getting quite a lot of work being put in right now, mostly through using virofronts, virofronts simply because it's a very efficient way of making things that might look similar but actually behave efficiently for different optical sizes and different uh, say, windows of access. Uh, that is increasingly important, again, especially if you look outside the developed world, where most of people's interactions with information is through essentially large portable screens rather than laptop screens and so on. And it's actually quite critical that you get it right there. Uh, again, very important because access to these kinds of texts uh, on these environments is a matter of exclusion uh, or inclusion in certain processes. If you think that all your banking only happens through your phone, uh, because there isn't in your village uh, a, a bank, uh, so there isn't an ATM, there is no uh, bank branch, uh, and there isn't anything that says is, you don't have a, a fast broadband connection, you only have your phone. Then actually whether you're able to read the stuff regardless of your age or the state of your eyes, is a matter of I am able to function as a uh, person in this economy or not. Uh, and then you start looking at things that enable uh, different genres, different uh, ideas of categories of documents and so on. Uh, that is interesting because it shows you a lot what conventions people expect in order to adopt certain texts. Uh, so I can show you this, which says uh, text for children to learn, and you don't need to start reading chocolate cake, chocolate cake, whatever. Uh, actually, that works for everyone. Uh, to understand that this is a child-friendly text, it's something in the style of the letters and the forms that uh, reminds you of other things that you've seen that tell you they're for children and therefore you make this association. That probably lowers the friction of adoption of a text like this, or it makes it easier to use for certain environments, especially if you need some complex characteristics, like in this case, it has a lot of the arithmetic symbols. Uh, or, we've seen pictograms earlier, uh, a lot of additional things that are not alphabetic necessarily, but uh, are part of what you would consider a typeface for certain uses. Do you have a set of symbols and pictograms that operate fluidly uh, with a typeface as part of it? So again, this opens up the idea of what is a typeface? It doesn't just have letters, it has a lot of non-alphabetic elements that are typographic, but also it might have the pictograms, it might have its own set of emojis, it might have a number of interaction elements that are part of the typeface. Uh, and then you have a level where this is much more driven by the market, and you have the environment for branding, you have the environment for identity and differentiation, which is a, it's a more refined environment, where also competition between different offerings uh, relies on these typographic distinctions. Uh, so then when I see this that I showed you earlier, I can start reading it in a specific way because of the style of the type that is being used and so on, that creates certain associations. But what is interesting, if you have a framework like this, then you can actually make some targets and you can say, here's all these communities. Uh, Unicode is a very flat uh, way of looking at how people use scripts, but I can actually determine uh, these kinds of levels of support for these communities, and then I can go back to the communities and say, what can you do to help me identify what do I need to do to support your script, your language, at this level of support. You can then prioritize resources, you can prioritize effort, and this is something that is happening uh, increasingly. So uh, I'm going to sort of close this by going full circle. Uh, I showed you Herard Dunger at the beginning. Uh, six months before Herard died, uh, his wife, Marianne Unger, died. Uh, Marianne was, I think safe to say, the preeminent historian uh, and researcher of uh, jewelry uh, for the Netherlands. And uh, shortly before she died, she published a book uh, called Why Jewelry Matters. Uh, I say, I have no idea about jewelry. I am uh, 
completely uh, new to this field, but I sort of read the book and towards the end, she has uh, six factors. And her point was, this is why jewelry matters. And she said, because they have cultural value, historical value, social value, emotional value, material value, and financial value. And I thought, well, she's just not, she's not talking about jewelry. She's talking about a lot of stuff that are part of some sort of creative output where design interacts with culture, with people, with communities, and so on. I can use the same kind of things to look at typefaces. Uh, and then I can see what do certain typefaces mean for their communities in cultural terms, in historical terms, social terms, emotional, how do people respond to them. Uh, the material changes a little bit uh, in our case because we're increasingly dematerializing what we're doing, but certainly we can see uh, five of the six of these criteria there. And I thought making these things more explicit is a good way for helping people to start asking questions about things because this idea of bias that I had uh, set out earlier needs to s somehow start to be addressed. And how do you say, well, what is my bias in this? And I need to start asking questions about myself. So maybe these six factors are entry points into me asking about my own bias in things, asking what does it mean to be a person with my cultural background, my uh, way of looking at things in these kind of parameters, so then I can perhaps shed some light in how I am looking at whatever it is that I am looking and other people's work in a certain way that is incomplete by definition and hopefully subject to improvement. So I will leave you with these uh, six factors. Uh, I hope they are food for thought. Uh, I think we'll have more and more to be talking about this idea of bias in design and bias in our perceptions and how we write things. Uh, my feeling is that we're entering a period of actually quite a lot of growth in how people write about design, especially typography, uh, with an awareness of the richness of the field uh, and also how much more has not been written, uh, especially outside the Northwest. Uh, and I'm sure that people in this audience will be taking part in this. So thank you very much. <laughs> 45 minutes. Okay. Thank you.